Hey everybody, it's Jason and welcome back to my channel. This is the seventh video in a series documenting the reassembly of a basket case 1987 Honda XL600R. Today we're focused on the top end, in particular we're looking at the piston and rings, cylinder, head and valve cover. There's a fair bit to cover, so let's get into it. We'll begin with fitting the piston rings to the cylinder. You may recall that we confirmed the fit of the original piston to the cylinder, but that the original rings were worn beyond reuse. I've got a decent set of oversized rings that we can make work, but they need to be modified slightly to fit properly. When fitting the rings in the bore, it's important they are in the right position to measure. The easiest way to do that is to use the piston to push them down, which will guarantee them to be squared up properly. As you might expect, they're a bit too big for this bore, so we have to file them down to get them to fit correctly. The manual calls for a 0.2 millimeter or eight thousandths of an inch gap for the first and second rings. I'm going to use a chainsaw file to slowly take material off the end. It's better to take your time and make multiple fittings than try to do it in one go. The last thing you want to do is take it too far. Eventually you'll get a feel for it. It took a while, but patience paid off and both rings are now fitted properly. The oil rings have a much wider tolerance and didn't need to be touched in this case. Now it's just a matter of putting them back into the piston. In this engine, the oil ring is actually three different pieces. There are two very thin metal rings that surround a much thicker folded ring. They all go in pretty easily compared to the two upper rings. When completed, the gaps in the two thin oil rings should be 180 degrees from each other. Rings are usually made from cast iron and are somewhat fragile, so you need to be careful when fitting them over the top of the piston. There are various tools for this, but I don't have any of them, so I just do it by hand, but carefully. The two rings have slightly different profiles, so make sure you get them in correctly. The manual has all the secrets. Now that they're in their grooves, the two upper rings should be rotated 180 degrees from each other and ideally 90 degrees from the two oil ring gaps. This will ensure that you'll get the best compression once the engine is running. With the piston completely assembled, we need to now compress the rings so they will slide easily into the cylinder bore. This means lots of assembly lube. You'll notice that from here on in, I am pretty generous with lubricating the components. I like to use this assembly lube when I want it to stay in a particular spot, and then I'll use engine oil when I want it to run into bearings and hard to reach places. Unfortunately, I don't have a proper ring compressor, but I've got a strip of aluminum and a large hose clamp that will work out just fine. The trick here is to use lots of lube and not to over tighten it. You also have to make sure there is enough room for the wrist pin to slide into place with the clamp holding these rings in place. It's a bit of a tight fit, but with a little bit of planning, it should work out just fine for you. Just before assembly, I've decided to give the small end of the connecting rod a quick hone, mostly just to give it a good clean and also uh, to just leave a nice fresh polish to it. I really don't want to do it for very long because we want to preserve as much of the bore size as possible. When finished, it's very important to give it a good clean to remove any grit or filings that might uh, still be left over. Before mounting the piston, it's a good idea to cover the open engine case. The small clips that hold the wrist pin in place are easily dropped and you really don't want to be searching for one in the gears of your engine. The piston has been prepped by inserting one of the clips on the bench and starting the wrist pin into one side of the piston. Make sure the intake side is facing the correct direction. Of course, everything has to be thoroughly looped. Once together, the last clip can be installed and the rags covering the open engine can be removed. 
Just before sealing it up, I like to add a bit of engine oil directly to the big end of the connecting rod. Remember that this engine has been sitting open for a few years and it will be starting very dry. All the lube you can get into it is very, very helpful. The leading edge of the cylinder has a bit of a bevel to guide the rings in. If things are too tight, it's okay to loosen the band a little to let it slide a little easier. Everything should just slip together. Once inserted, the clamp and the aluminum strip can be removed. Make sure that the inside of the bore is well oiled up, then slide the cylinder home into the crankcase. The cylinder is finally attached to the crankcase by means of four 10 millimeter bolts that have to be torqued to 35 foot pounds. Before putting on the cylinder head, we need to pull out the timing chain and install the second guide. It has to be put into its slot on the cylinder properly so that the head can secure it in place. Once again, everything gets a liberal coating of motor oil before being sealed up. I mean, you really can't use too much. Before being mated, I like to give both surfaces a good cleaning to make sure that they have uh, every chance to seal properly. It really only takes a second and it's good practice to keep things as clean as possible when putting together an engine. With the new head gasket and the two locating pins in place, the cylinder head slides into position without any issues at all. Once again, these bikes are designed to only be assembled in one way and it's just about impossible to mess it up. There are six 8mm bolts that secure the head to the cylinder. The manual recommends that they be torqued to 23 foot-pounds. Before we proceed any further with the camshaft and top end, I need to be able to align the piston to top dead center using the timing marks on the flywheel. There's a few other things that need to be buttoned up at the same time, like the oil seals on the output shaft and gear spline. I like to spray down these larger seals with gasket adhesive so they stay in place a little bit better. Now before putting the cover on I need to make sure that the clutch pushrod components are in place. Once they're installed the cover fits on easily and is aligned using two locating pins. Then all the bolts can be started by hand before being torqued to 10 foot-pounds. This screen wire connects the neutral switch to the electrical harness. It has to be routed carefully to keep it well clear of the drive sprocket and chain. The last item on this side of the engine is the oil drain plug. It gets a new copper washer and is torqued to 25 foot-pounds. 
Now I can time the engine to top dead center using the peephole found in the side of the case I just installed. I'm going to wait until after the cam is in place to put the other cover on. It's handy to use the clutch to rotate the engine and there's always the risk of dropping small pieces down the timing chain opening. As part of the preparation to install the camshaft, I need to preload the cam chain tensioner and it can be a bit of a fight to set it up. Of course, Honda has a tool for it, but once again, I don't have it. Instead, I use a cable tie and a pair of leather gloves. I tension it as much as possible with my fingers, then press down hard on the edge of a piece of wood while I adjust the cable tie as I go. It's kind of primitive, but it gets the job done. Now that we've got the piston in position, the cam's timing gear needs to be meshed into the chain so that the little grooves on either side of it line up with the top of the head. Once that's done, then the engine has to be rotated 90 degrees so that the camshaft can be slid into the timing gear. Maybe there's an easier way, but I've never been able to find it. As long as you keep tension on the chain with the gear in it, it should not slip out of time. Still, I always double check before moving on to the valve cover. It's easiest to install the cam tensioner now before you rotate it back and put in the two bolts that hold the gear onto the cam. Once it's all together and confirmed to be tight, it's just a matter of sliding a knife or a pair of scissors down and snipping the cable tie, then pulling it out. Because the side cover is still off, just take a second to check the tension on the timing chain. It should be fairly tight. There's a little bit of prep involved before bolting the valve cover on. The first thing I like to do is loosen the valve adjuster screws. Although this isn't completely necessary, it makes it a lot easier to set the cover on by hand. I follow this with a generous application of assembly lube to the rocker arm faces and in all the little surfaces that involve contact and movements. I do the same thing to the lobes of the camshaft, rotating the engine to cover the entire surface of the lobes. I've found that the lower portion of the valve cover is a very common spot for oil leaks. To prevent that, I use Loctite 518 flange sealant, which is my go-to solution for oil leaks. I hate oil leaks. Just a reminder to be careful of the dowel that holds the decompression lever in place. It falls out very easily and is one of those small parts that often needs to be fished out of the engine. I like to lock tight mine in place. There are two locating pins that align the valve cover to the head. It makes things a lot easier to position the decompression lever in a way that it doesn't interfere with the related exhaust valve. All of the bolts can be installed and torqued to 10 foot-pounds. Well, it turns out that I'm missing one of the original 6mm bolts, so I temporarily use another one from my inventory. I'll order a new one from Honda and replace it when it comes in. It's just really important to include it so that I can torque the cover on evenly and allow the Loctite to set properly. Now that the top end is installed, it's safe to put the remaining side cover on. Once again, there is a bit of prep required. The oil pump drive gear slips on pretty easily and the small orifice that connects the oil pump to the side cover needs to be installed. 
the assembly lube is really helpful in holding it in place. Finally, the kickstart components are returned to their shaft. This time I use motor oil to lube it along with the end of the crankshaft which needs to slide into an internal oil seal. With all this done, I can position the new paper gasket, locating pins, and slide the cover back onto the block. Even though it won't be used, the kickstart decompression lever is an important part of the kickstart mechanism. It needs to be rocked to one side before the case can be finally seated. The bolts can all be replaced, and there are two nuts along the bottom of the case that need to be added along with copper washers to seal them. I also put copper washers on the other two lower bolts just to be safe. Everything now can be torqued to 10 foot-pounds. The engine is now back together, but there are still a few things that can be done before installing it back into the frame. The oil line that runs from the oil pump to the valve cover connects with two banjo bolts and two small keeper bolts on the side of the cylinder. Each banjo bolt also gets two new copper washers. For now, I'm just going to snug them in place. I like to loosen the top banjo bolt when the engine first starts to confirm that the oil pump is working. Now the last thing I want to do is adjust the valves. Since the cable hasn't been installed yet, I take the slack out of the decompression lever using a cable tie. Once I confirm that it's still at top dead center, I adjust the gap on the exhaust valves to four thousandths of an inch and the intakes to two thousandths of an inch although I like to leave them just a little bit loose until the engine is broken in a bit. Then it's time to cover everything up with the screw-in adjusting covers and finally the engine assembly is complete. In the next video, I will prepare the frame so that it is ready to accept this behemoth, which will bring us closer to getting this bike back on the road. If you like this stuff, please subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment, and thank you very much for watching.